This bill sets out more requirements uh, for those wanting to seek to cast their vote. Um, and the question is um, about whether those requirements are justified and necessary. Um, they're only justified if they are actually necessary to deal with a current or anticipated problem. And that is my first question uh, to our first panel. There are very few uh, reports of um, fraud at polling stations, i.e. people purporting to vote as somebody who they are not. Um, is this because it is not happening or is it because um, it's hard to detect? And what are the current methods uh, to prevent um, people conducting fraud at the polling station? We have to look at the problem uh, before we will then turn to questions about whether or not the, pro the proposed solution in this bill is the right response to it. So could I ask that first question about um, prevalence of voter fraud in the UK um, to our panel, starting off with um, Toby James, please. Thank you very much, and thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation to be able to, uh, to be with you this afternoon. Um, I mean, to be clear, the evidence, um, the academic evidence here is unanimous that that uh, personation is actually exceptional, exceptionally rare. Um, the Electoral Commission can speak perhaps about the, uh, the frequency of allegations and prosecutions, which, as we know, tend to be very low. Um, with a colleague um, at University of, East sorry, University of Newcastle, uh, we've conducted poll worker studies, uh, which involve surveys with inside polling stations to work out types of problems that, that may occur on election day. And they are all unanimous that uh, uh, personation is, is, is very rare. Uh, we've got international surveys of experts, which the Electoral Integrity Projects undertake, and they also point to the UK as not having a, a, a current problem uh, with voter fraud. And we've also got evidence from cross-national studies um, from countries like the US that have a similar type of uh, system within polling stations. And that also points to the situation of, of voter fraud being uh, exceptionally, exceptionally rare. Now, um, of course, we should be open-minded about um, potential new evidence, you know, things that the world changes. Um, but as it stands, there is no evidence that this um, actually um, is, is a prevalent uh, problem. Um, and there are some mechanisms there that can be undertaken uh, to prevent this within polling stations, uh, such as, for example, um, uh, officials being able to report a potential case to the police um, and, and to gather information within, within polling stations. So as it stands, I think the measures, um, certainly photographic identification is certainly not warranted on, on the basis of the evidence. Um, thank you. Um, can we hear from Jessica and then uh, Simon Woolley? I would echo what, what Toby says, and I won't go over that again for purposes of time, but I suppose I would just add that as well as the question of is it is it possible that it's it's happening, I think we should add the question of is it plausible? Um, and what is the motive for this crime? One presumes it would be to change an election result, and to change an election result by personation would, would require a huge operation. Um, identifying which constituents that we see would be marginal enough make a difference. That's, that's difficult for political scientists, um, let alone anyone else. And on, on top of that, lots of people would have to be involved. Um, you'd have to know who wasn't going to vote in order for that not to be detected. And, and presumably the candidate would, would have to be aware of this. We're, we're talking a large scale operation. And I think it's implausible to believe that that could be going on undetected. So you're saying it's, it's not just that we don't have evidence whether it's happening or not. It's implausible that it would be happening because of the structure of our system is such that you need such a big operation to actually effect a change in the result that therefore there's not any point in anybody doing it under our current system. Yes, that would be a summary of what I'm saying in the sense of the, the plausibility of why someone would risk what is a criminal offence in order to do to do this on, and and plus the scale of it would would make it very noticeable okay thank you uh simon um and could you say something about the context of um voter registration as well well i think context fraud is, fraud in voter registration yes i think context is 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 really really important uh, in this because uh, often in some communities some uh asian communities there's been charges of fraud but when it's been 
investigated thoroughly that shown not to be the case or, or, or not substantive in any, in any way. And often it's, uh, I don't like it when people like me say to communities, we need to, to register to vote, we need to vote. And then when they do in great numbers, people are calling foul. And uh, that's uh, deeply unfair when, when that occurs. Uh, so I think as uh, Dr. Jess uh, outlined, that one, it's not plausible, and two, as Professor Toby James outlined, the evidence clearly shows that there is no, it's not even large scale, there's not even any, any scale of fraud that we can see. So do you, can I just ask for a, a sort of quick answer from each of you? Do you then feel that this bill, if there's no evidence and um, you don't feel that there's any sense that the additional requirements for voting um, are necessary, that, um, that this really could be characterised, this bill, rather than as voter protection, as voter suppression? Well, I know that that's been, those accusations have been made. And I think all you have to do is to look at whether or not it's proportionate. You have to see what is the scale of fraud, if there is, and if you can count the fraud, fraudulent people come into the ballot box on one hand, then you can see the proportion. If, on the other hand, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, that might be impeded by this imposition, then you clearly see that it's not proportionate. And actually, it could have a, a monstrous negative effect, which some have characterised as voter suppression. Um, thank you. Joanna Cherry. Thanks very much, Chair. Good afternoon, panel. My name is Joanna Cherry. I'm the Member of Parliament for Edinburgh South West. Um, can I ask you this? Um, unlike most countries that have voter ID, the United Kingdom doesn't require its citizens to carry ID cards. So how would this complicate voter ID proposals? And perhaps I could start with Dr Garland. Yes, it complicates it quite significantly. Of course, in European countries um, where the idea is required, people don't. Uh, people do have a, a card that they're required to, to carry a, around with them. Um, so that's something that's already about a person when they walk into the polling station. They don't have to apply for it separately. They don't have to pay for it. And it's the it's the cost option which is particularly worrying here, as we know that a lot of photo IDs or the most common ones are you have to pay for. Um, and we also know that that's not equally distributed across society. So that suggests that this is going to affect particular groups. And of course, um, the, the closest parallel is in the United States, um, where we've seen these measures have been hugely discriminatory against particular groups. So, so that's where the comparison um, is particularly worrying. I mean, the women in the street might say, but surely most people have a driving license or a passport. Is, is that the case? No, not at all. I mean, yes, we're talking the majority of people, but the Cabinet Office research that came out a couple of weeks ago is suggesting that 9% um, of people don't have um, in-date recognisable photo ID. And if you expand it a bit to um, out of date, but still recognisable ID, that's still 4% of people that don't have that ID. So it might seem like a small in percentage terms, but actually, if you look at that across um, at the voters in general, that, that does extend into millions of people. And I think that cabinet office research also said that close to half of the people without photo ID said they were unlikely or very unlikely to apply for voter ID. And if, if we're talking about an electorate of 46 million, that's about 2 million people who'd be unlikely to apply for voter ID. That's right, isn't it? Yes, it was 42% of those who didn't have the ID said that, yes, highly unlikely or unlikely to apply. So the very group that we're most concerned about being excluded from elections are, you know, the group that are likely not to be or highly likely not to be applying for that card. So, so that's really worrying. I wonder if I could turn to you, Lord Willie. The, uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission have said that the requirement to produce photo ID would have a disproportionate impact on voters with protected characteristics such as age, gender reassignment, 
disability and and ethnic minorities. Now, um, I see other third sector organisations like the Runnymede Trust have backed them up on that. Can, can you comment on that? I, I can. Look, um, uh, that I have run Operation Black for 25 years. Uh, our starting point is voting and getting people registered to vote. And we've always, it's always been an uphill battle. Uh, one, because uh, people are uh, distrustful of, of, of authorities and what they might do with the with their information. So they've been reluctant and we've had to take them on a, a journey to say, this is how we engage in, in civic society. We need to register to vote and we, we need to vote. Now, what I'm deeply afraid of, if there's another layer of bureaucracy, then it's another impediment to a group who are already hesitant to fully engage in the democratic process. And, you know, part of this mistrust, it's real. We've seen it with vaccinations, mistrust in the government, mistrust in institutions, and that has cost lives. It's made us all a little bit unsafe. And so this hesitancy is extremely real. And of course, there's another layer to this too, because uh, as uh, there's quite a few in Black, Asian, minority ethnic communities that feel that uh, government, uh, let's say, uh, that doesn't have their best interest at heart, that may want to find uh, a, a route for, for these ID cards for as a big brother to watch over them. And that adds to this further distrust. And for someone like me, it's heartbreaking because my role for the past uh, uh, quarter of a century has been to encourage our communities to engage in the democratic process as, as never before. Thank you. Now, Professor James, is there any further evidence or research that shows how the lack of, of mandated ID cards, photo ID cards in the United Kingdom might complicate voter ID proposals? Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, we can look at the pilots of some of this and to come back to an earlier question that you got there um, about um, the lack of uniform ID being available. One thing that came through that was that actually lots of people did not vote in those pilots, not because they didn't necessarily have the form of ID, uh, but because they philosophically declined to provide this form of ID. And that actually led to um, some you know, quite significant uh, proportion um, of people not being able uh, to cast their cast their vote. Um, I mean, I'd also add um, it's important to note that actually voter ID requirements, although are much more common in countries where they do have those uh, national ID cards, like in Europe, in the Anglosphere, where you don't have those um, national ID cards available, such as New Zealand, uh, such as Australia and, the, and parts of the US still, uh, voter ID is much less likely to be required. Um, and that's, that's quite important there too. And I think the other community that I've really stressed the importance of the potential impact here um, is also the trans um, and gender non-conforming communities uh, as, as well. Um, the, electoral, the Cabinet Office has published uh, um, its recent survey of individuals asking uh, who has got the available form of ID that we've already heard about already. It's not in the, the overall narrative, but in the data tables, they do. it is very, very clear that there's a differential impact in terms of sexuality um, and also in terms of gender as well. Uh, and people that specify other in response to those, those questions are much, much less likely uh, to have access to those forms of ID. So there are real questions there about whether, um, you know, given these are protected groups, whether this would be in line with um, uh, the Equalities Act. Yeah, and that very much supports what the Equality and Human Rights Commission have said about the potential impact on people with a protected characteristic. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those um, answers. Um, could we turn to Lord Dubbs for the next question? And I know he's got uh, an issue to raise about Northern Ireland as well. Lord Dubbs, could you unmute yourself, um, Lord Dubbs, and then we can hear you. Forgetting. Hi. Thank, th thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm a Labour member, member of the Lords. My, my first question is this. Uh, we rarely referred to Article 3 of Protocol 1 of the ECHR that any interference with the right to vote must be proportionate. Now, you've all stated your views about the merits of this proposal, but assuming it goes ahead, an assumption I've 
uh, we could challenge. Simply it goes ahead. What measures could be adopted to ensure that the voter ID requirement does not disproportionately interfere with the right to vote while also achieving the aim of preventing voter fraud? Uh, could Simon start on that one? Yes, please? well, it's impossible to guarantee that. And uh, in many ways, we're putting the cart before the horse because one of the big factors uh, to, for voter registration and voter engagement is uh, political education, uh, citizenship, comprehensive citizenship in schools and in communities. That's where our effort should be, uh, not on this uh, cul-de-sac debate on voter ID that is, can be clearly seen to be used for, for other means. If, if, we want a, if we want a robust democracy, then we should be saying, what is the nature of our citizenship education? But not just in primary schools and secondary schools, but in communities too, that to educate people on why it's important to engage. You know, in any, in any national election, we rarely get over 55, 60%. And so there's huge swathes of our public not engaging in the most important civic role that we could all play. To answer your question, Lord Dubs, is that, is that, you know, what could we do? Well, we can do little or nothing. One, to confront the hesitancy. One, to confront the fact that people will not have the right information so that they can exercise their democratic franchise. That we will have to expect a monstrous drop-off of people engaging in the democratic process if this goes ahead. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, do you want to, have you anything to add to that? I would say that I agree entirely with what Lord Willie says there, but of course there are, um, assuming it will be implemented and, and there's no way of implementing it without having an impact, and we've already been over the disproportionality of that, but if it is implemented, then some things would have to be the case, such as, you know, free IDs available. And when we look at the, the US, you know, a lot of those cases, people can sign something on the day, they can do something in the polling station, which enables them to carry on voting. And, 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 and that would be something to look at because it's in certain cases in the States as well, non-photo ID is available. If we move towards a purely photographic ID requirement, then we're looking at a proposal here that, that's stricter than many of the US states where we've seen these proposals have a, a dramatic um, impact on, on the quality. So, so that's a very dangerous road that we would want to avoid at all costs. Right. Uh, have you any, anything to add, uh, Toby? Yes, I mean, I think ideally, I entirely agree with um, the former speakers that no, no action is, is the best course of action. Uh, there's also a huge opportunity cost here in terms of the opportunity to fix problems with voter registration. In reality, if this is to proceed, then I would suggest three things. Um, the first is non-photographic um, identification. Uh, one of the pilots was um, to simply allow people to present their poll card. Um, everyone who's registered will have their poll card. So that just seems like a, a very a non discriminatory and simple uh, and cheap and free way uh, of doing that. Uh, the second one is to use a system um, known as provisional ballots uh, in the US, sometimes known as tendered ballots in the UK. Uh, and what this allows people to do is if for some reason their name is not on the register on the day of the election, or if they've forgotten their ID, they don't have it to hand, then they're still able to cast a vote. It's put aside uh, and then they're given a period of time, perhaps either to present that, um, that ID or um, um, have their status checked or you know, have that solution um, made through, through other means. Uh, and then the third system is also perhaps through something called a vouching system, which has been in place in Canada. Um, so what this, what this allows is for perhaps you go to the polling stations with your family and one member of your family uh, has forgotten their ID, they don't have it to hand, you can sign to say this is my, my brother, my sister, my grandmother, uh, whoever, it, whoever that is, uh, your neighbour, uh, and that then is kept on record as evidence of, of who that person is and that provides another mechanism for making sure that people aren't prevented actually from casting uh, their votes. Unfortunately I can't see any of that in the Obviously, the bill hasn't been published, but I can't see any of that in the government 
proposal so far. And I think those are, could be really, really important fixes that the committee could recommend. Right, thank you. Just a, just a very quick, a quick one, a quick, quick supplementary to that. Uh, some of the people who support these proposals say that it works perfectly well in Northern Ireland. Have you any comment on that, um, uh, Simon? No Thank comment. Uh, Simon, you're you're muted. Yes. No. I have no comment. I have he no com has a comment. What about our other two witnesses? Any comment on that? Yes, just, just briefly, just to say that I don't think it's really been thoroughly evaluated in Northern Ireland. It was actually introduced uh, some time ago, um, I think it was 2003, uh, and there was some evidence um, that I think um, a, a small proportion of the electorate didn't have access to the idea or they didn't, um, weren't able to present that on the day of the election. So it's worth going back to those original reports. Um, since then, it's often been said, well, it, it works fine in Northern Ireland, but we haven't had a really thorough study, to the best of my knowledge, such as where you, ha you have um, the collection of data within polling stations within in Northern Ireland to see well, how many people are, uh, are actually not able to, to provide uh, the requisite form of ID, uh, or how many people didn't actually even make it to the, to the polling stations uh, because they, they didn't have at the hand um, in, in any case. So I, I think we shouldn't be too quick to um, assume that everything's worked perfectly in, in, in Northern Ireland. Jessica, have you anything to add to that? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Baroness Ludford. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Sarah Ludford. I'm a Liberal Democrat member of the House of Lords. Uh, just a, a thought before I direct my question initially to um, Lord Woolley. Um, I thought it was an interesting suggestion to have to show your poll card from Professor James. Um, I just reflect that I spent decades of involvement in political campaigning telling people they don't need their poll card uh, to, 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 um, to go and vote in, in the polling station. Um, and, and also perhaps there would be an effect on people who live in um, you know, multi-occupied uh, blocks uh, where, where things perhaps aren't quite as organized as a sort of single um, household um, house. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Uh, so my question is uh, first of all directed to uh, Lord Woolley, um, and that is that Article 14 of the ECHR requires that legislation must not interfere with human rights in a discriminatory way. And in our report uh, on black people, racism and human rights, we highlight highlighted the issue of low voter registration among black communities. You've covered, you know, you've covered this in early remarks, but um, in your opinion, um, would the introduction of voter ID further discourage members of those communities from registering to vote and hence from voting? And if so, what, if anything, could be done about it? Well, I do think it would be uh, at a further layer discriminatory uh, layer and put people off to such a level that we've taken the exceptional case of challenging the government in court, uh, along with along with the Running Me Trust and Voice for Change. We've instigated a judicial review, uh, which is going through the courts as we as as we speak. And central to that, uh, Sarah is that the government have not undertaken an equalities assessment, impact assessment on this process. So I can tell you it will have an impact, but unless that impact assessment has been done, I can't prove it. And as you said, this is so important. This, is, this, this strikes to the heart of who we are as a society, that we felt we had no other option but to challenge the, the government in, in the court. Now, I don't know whether they will get it through before we get our challenge, because that's still pending, but it's that serious. Thanks, and it, can I just um, add a supplementary? And I, I mean, I know your focus is, is particularly on Operation Black Vote, um, an admirable organization, if I may say so, but are, are you aware of any other groups that could be disproportionately affected by a voter ID requirement? Well, I mean, this is, the, this is the thing. This will go right across the board. This will go to the elderly. This will go to those in um, temporary accommodation. 
This will go to young people. There's a whole plethora of people that will be caught up. But uh, of course, that uh, there's often there's often a mantra uh, that that says that you know the elderly will 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 vote and and uh, there there are a plethora of other people, particularly particularly Black Asian and minority ethnic communities, who have in the past predominantly voted uh, Labour. That has changed significantly in the in the last few years, um, but nevertheless, it's still majority. So people feel that if we are targeted, is there something else at play here uh, for to make these obstacles uh, larger than they should be? But it's not just our this not just our communities that I'm particularly concerned about. There's a whole plethora of people that will get caught up in this, and at the heart of it. It is, it is uh, the, the obstacle for people to exercise their franchise, which is the biggest problem. Could I ask Dr. Garland um, or Professor James if you have anything to add to that? Um, okay, if you, if, if you haven't, then oh, thanks. Professor for James. Professor James wants to add something, sorry. Um, yeah, just briefly, the government's uh, research on who has access to the appropriate forms of identification also shows lower take-up rates amongst unemployed and citizens and those with, with fewer qualifications. So there's clearly an, an economic and educational uh, dimension to this. Um, but also, even, even irrespective of whether particular groups are, are not affected, and I think they will be, um, I mean, 4% not having a um, photographic identification in which they're recognisable is an electorate of what 47 million and that's 1.9 million people who, who, who could be affected on, on an election that's an enormous number of people so thank you thank you very much I think um, what Lord Woolley said about uh, understanding the lessons of vaccine hesitation uh, hesitancy and reading across to uh, voting hesitancy I think it's a really important point and the next question is to is from Lord Brabazon Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair. I'm Lord Braverson, Conservative Member of the House Lords. I want to turn, please, to registration. Uh, we have also called for the government to consider introducing automatic voter registration. What do you think the current obstacles are that prevent people from registering to vote? And could automatic registration mitigate any effects of a voter ID requirement? I don't know who wants to go first on that one. Well, I'm happy to jump in. I wholeheartedly agree with automatic voter registration. Uh, I think it could be done. We have the technology to do it. And uh, we, would see, we would see many more people engage in the democratic process, which everybody on this, on, in, in this committee wants to see. But it's not a silver bullet. And it's not a silver bullet for, for precisely this reason. You could get many more people automatically registered, but you still wouldn't get everybody to the polls. And you would get many more people to the polls once you engage in a comprehensive citizenship education to understand these institutions, how they work, how they can be successfully accessed and move the dial. I am tired. I am tired in my 30 years of activism and go into communities and say, we must engage. And they say to me, it makes no difference even though you know and I know around this, around this Zoom that elections are won and lost in the margins and a few votes here and a few votes there can make all the difference. But whether they're in a marginal seat or not, if they don't feel empowered to make a difference, then we can register everyone to vote, but we're still not getting into the polls. So for, for, for me, Lord Brabazon, it's an holistic approach. It's saying we want a healthy democracy, an inclusive democracy. So we do the education. We tear down the barriers, not erect them. But we engage in a way where people feel if they vote, then, then they will be listened to. Right, so thank you very much. That's... Okay, thank you. I mean, whilst it's not a silver bullet for actual participating in the vote by post or in person, it is a silver bullet automatic registration for dealing with under registration insofar as it affects the boundaries and the way constituencies um, are drawn up. So um, uh, I know that's a point you've made um, in the past, Lord Woolley. 
one hundred percent. And I and I think I just think it's not beyond us to get that over the line. And I, I'm frustrated why that doesn't happen. Okay, thank you. Um, could we turn to Baroness Massey for the next question? Good afternoon. I'm Dorian Massey. I'm a Labour peer in the House of Lords. Um, we've touched on some of the issues in my question already, but there may be elements that haven't been covered. So I'd like to just uh, ask you. Um, Evidence from the pilots conducted local elections. Um, do, you, do you find that introduction of voter ID requirement may dissuade individuals or certain groups of individuals from voting? And I'll put the two questions together. In some of the trials, individuals who forgot to bring ID to the polling station did not then return to vote with the required ID. How could this be? Mitigate. I think Lord Willis answered that in part already. Maybe he'd just like to start. Yes. Well, I was astonished too that when you're creating a lair uh, that people have to think about, I've got to take my ID. And then when they got the wrong ID, they're going back home and saying, forget it. And I, I, the, the, the numbers were really shocking. And but then are we are we surprised that, that people have in some quarters, such negativity towards our democratic process that you, you leave your house and you say, right, I'm going to exercise my franchise. And then you're told that you can't. Then you just say, this is why, this is why I'm not bothering. Mm -hmm. So it, for, for, for people like me that, that, has, that have seen voter engagement as our North Star for a decent society, we have to say, it's heartbreaking. Okay. Uh, Jessica, do you have any comments on that, particularly on, on for example, what you brought up earlier on about the um, the introduction of voter ID? Yes, it's very difficult to to know how, how that chilling effect, um, where which Lord Willie mentioned earlier, for people who might be feeling that, um, distrustful of authorities, that this is an extra an extra barrier to 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 access to the polling station. We do know from the, the pilots. Um, from the surveys that the Electoral Commission and the Cabinet Office did after the, the pilots of this policy, was that about 2% of people said that they didn't turn out to vote because of the ID requirement. And again, yes, it's a small percentage, but that's still very damaging and, and completely out of proportion to the instances of, of fraud. And, and the, the Cabinet Office recent research, again, um, just to talk about that, 27% of those without any form of ID. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, to vote um, if they Dr. Want to Gardens, we just, we just lost you. We had 27%. Could you just say what the 27% is? Of course, apologies. 27% of those without any form of ID said it would make them less likely to vote if they were asked to present ID. So we're getting a, a picture of a, a chilling, a potential chilling effect on, on people turning out. And of course, as Lord Willie was saying, it would be wonderful if everyone was so committed to voting that they would go to a polling station, come back home, go back again. But we know the reality of the situation is people are voting amongst the other responsibilities in their lives. Uh, Toby, James, do you have any comments to add? Thank you. So one of the things we've seen from our poll worker studies is that one, one of the most frequent problems is people turning up wanting to vote and then not being able to vote because their name's not on the electoral register. That's the most common way in which people actually aren't able to vote. But this, the poll, um, the pilots of voter ID uh, tended to show that this would be a much greater problem than that one. Uh, it would lead to more people being turned away uh, than the, the most significant existing uh, problem. Um, and I'd also flag that out of the different pilots that, that were experimented with, with the poll card ID mo model, although it did lead to, to people being turned away, uh, the impact was much less. So non-photographic ID is clearly better than, than, than photographic ID. Thank you. That is, if any ID is actually even necessary at all in the first place. I, like Baroness Ludford, have, when encouraging people to vote, have said, when they say, I've lost my polling card, I've said, don't worry, just go down there. Um, now, next question, Lord Singh, please. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, Indrajit Singh, a crossbench member of the House of Lords. Um, there's three parts to this question. That, In your view, if a voter ID requirement is introduced, what would be an acceptable form of ID? Then the government are proposing to introduce a electoral 
identity card that will be issued by local authorities as is currently done in Northern Ireland. What needs to be done to ensure that these IDs are easy to obtain so as to ensure voters who would otherwise have no acceptable photographic ID are still able to vote? Do you think a photo ID requirement would affect turnout? And then, how do you think the government and local authorities can ensure voters who would otherwise not have an acceptable form of ID to take up the offer of an electoral identity card? Would any of you, uh, who would like to come in first? Uh, yes, Professor Toby. Uh. Thank you very much, Lord Singh. Uh, I mean, to reiterate, obviously, the key things I would stress is the use of poll card as one as one like, form of ID, uh, making provisional ballots possible, having a vouching system are really important. Uh, I, I feel very sceptical about the idea of an electoral identity card. I know that's the modern Northern Ireland, uh, and some, some framework is better than the no framework in, in, in some ways. But I think if you think of it about the amount of extra effort it's going to take uh, for a citizen to actually go and get one of these uh, applied for ahead of the election and however long that's going to take for them to receive, I think it could be very problematic. I think there's also a real threat there for local authorities and thinking about who's going to administer this and who's going to pay for this. Our research shows that local authorities have been under increasing pressure over the last few years because of the additional burdens introduced by individual uh, electoral registration because of cuts that have been made at, at local authority level. This is places a real pressure um, upon them. So asking them to also provide these forms of ID uh, and Dr. Stuart Wilkes Heag from Liverpool University has estimated that this could be millions of uh, forms of ID that need to be created does look like a very difficult and challenging situation. So I'd be, although this helps in some ways, um, it could cause um, other problems. So avoiding this would be much better. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, Lord Woodley, would you like to comment? Well, I think I will put the question back to you and others on, on this committee. What would be an acceptable democratic price in regards to people falling off? The, the being able to vote 1,000, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, half a million, what would be acceptable? I, I, I don't want to see 10 people come off, much less the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. I think this is a question that we've all got to ask ourselves. Yeah, that's... Um... Good food for thought, but uh, Dr. Jessica Garland, would you like to comment on? We just say of the free elector card, just the cautions around that. This isn't a silver bullet. You can just go and pick up a free elector card if you don't have the IDs. When we look at the evidence in the states, most marginalised communities who um, need to get the free ID are also struggling to get it. So, for instance, the issuing office is a long way from their home. They have to pay for transport to get to the issuing office. The office is only open on hours when they're working. There are lots of other barriers. The free elector card is not, not a simple or straightforward um, idea. And, and as um, Professor James has said, these, um, you know, it does put a pressure on councils, both in um, advertising its availability and, and, and keep making it um, available as well. Thank you so much. Back to you, Jack. Thank you. And um, could we have the next the final question to this panel from Lord Hen Henley about non-photographic ID that might be um, acceptable? Uh, Lord Henley, Conservative Member of the House Lord, thank you very much, Chair. Um, Professor James talked about uh, Canadian experience and uh, particularly um, using vouching, I, I presume getting a person along to assist in your identification. I wonder if you could just expand a little on that and um, look again at, at Canada, where I gather that uh, you are permitted to present two pieces of non-photographic ID at polling stations to prove your uh, identity and residence. And the list of permitted documents includes bank statements, birth certificates, uh, later information cards. Uh, what is your view about that? Do you think those would be an acceptable form of ID, or do you think um, they, they just don't work? Yes, yeah, so you certainly 
you know, I mean, on vaccine to begin with, it's worth saying that um, this has been in place in Canada for a long period of time. Mm. Then tried to then then remove this, but um, actually realised that there was a mistake that in, in doing so, and actually then reintroduced it. So it is a really very important uh, part of uh, their system there. Uh, in general, you know, I agree with everyone else that um, uh, no ID is the best solution. Um, in some ways, allowing other forms of identification is, is a really uh, positive. Uh, way forward. Um, so th these uh, allowing bank statements, birth certificates, photo identification cards, or whatever else is, is good. But you also have to think about it a little bit from the perspective of the of the administrator there as well. So um, we, uh, although not as many people vote as we would like, uh, it's certainly the case still that at some polling stations you do get queues. Uh, and where you get queues, you then lead to a situation where people see the queue and are known to then turn away and think, well, maybe I don't want to vote um, after all. So you have to make the system as much as possible simple. Um, so therefore, I think the polling card option is, is important to include. Allowing other mechanisms like um, the bank statements is also good, um, but as, as, as simpler you can make the system uh, for the voter and putting the voter first, um, the, the better, I think. I don't, I don't know whether Lord Woodley or um, Dr. Garland would like to come in. Lord Henley, Lord Henley, I think it would make a, a negligible difference um, because if you you imagine for a second that you're reluctant to to vote, uh, and then you're thinking, okay, now I've got to look through the drawers and get some uh, some bills and and another layer, another layer, and so I think the difference it would make would be hardly noticeable, particularly with that with that group who are already reluctant mm -hmm. uh, to to engage. Look, we. I don't know what your remit is with this, but if you're on a front foot and you had a blank sheet, you say, we've got to be putting more energy in political education. And when people go to the, to the booths, we've got to make it easier, not more restrictive, that what we're doing at the moment is completely the opposite. You're on mute now. Well, thank you very much.